we're, this is about talking to people. That's what interviews are. Um, and one of the things I've noticed, particularly with younger journalists, um, is that it's the journalists who uh, sometimes are reluctant to talk to people, especially students I'm finding are reluctant to actually talk face to face or voice to voice with people, either in person, by phone or whatever. But the other reluctant source sometimes is the, uh, the person you're actually needing to talk to. So I hope this session will, uh, will address that. Um, so what, what is an interview? Um, one of the things that, uh, let me get to the next slide here. Um, an interview, sorry, an interview is a conversation. I'm just trying to stay there. There we go. An interview is a conversation with a purpose. You have a, uh, it, and remember, it's, an, it's a conversation, not an interrogation. The fact that you're a uh, journalist and maybe you're going to be talking to a, uh, a government official or someone who uh, you feel like you need to uh, hold to account, um, it's still a conversation. And so if we treat it that way, I think it's going to uh, uh, have a, a, a little more success. So um, I'll give you a sense of, of sorry, I'm, I'm hopping through this uh, with, some, uh, with some difficulty, obviously. Um, so let me just stop here for a second. So as Melissa said, I'm the founder and the director of this journalism program at my uh, school in San Diego. Jennifer has been here. She can tell you all about it. Uh, and I uh, host this Writers' Symposium by the Sea, where we've had some really great writers come and just talk about the craft of writing. All right. Um, so I've also been a, uh, a journalist for a long time, um, written for Boy, this is hopping around. I apologize. Um, no worries, no worries. Uh, so I've been a journalist for a long time, uh, written for the New York Times and the Boston Globe, a uh, uh, number of magazines, um, websites, television, all that. Uh, done a bunch of books. And then these, uh, these writers symposium uh, interviews have been uh, downloaded and viewed more than uh, 5 million times. I can show you where you, um, where you can get those. Um, so what I want to do is, is just kind of go through um, some, of the, uh, some of the things that I think all of us are uh, facing as, uh, as journalists. Intuitively, we know that interviews are important, but it helps to know why they're important. Uh, in an age of big data and Google searches, do we even need people in our stories? Uh, the answer is emphatically yes, uh, because we need the human voice. That's, that's what adds something to these stories. We need the human voice. We need their analysis, their perspective, their tone, their insight, the detail, the nuance, the color, and the, uh, and the shared humanity. Uh, regardless of whether our sources are shy or outgoing, or whether you're shy or outgoing, um, we need to know how to talk to people. So we think about stories that uh, about natural disasters, or as we were thinking about with uh, Ukraine, or um, border areas that are receiving um, uh, refugees. We think about those, or stories about tainted water supplies, or the impact of online education, or the experience of isolation uh, this past uh, couple of years. We do need the facts and figures. There's no question about that. But we also need the human story. Uh, the rescues, the human cost, the human spirit, and the uh, and the survival instinct. We need all of that, and you only get that by talking to people. So the Boston Globe years ago sent me up to uh, Northern California to cover some wildfires uh, that had been burning for weeks. And they said that they already had the number of acres that were burned. They had the facts. They had the number of acres, the cost of the lost property. Um, but they wanted me to find a group of firefighters uh, who had been working without relief for a long time and tell their story. As it turns out, I found a group of volunteer firefighters who had been working for weeks and now they were defending an area that included their own homes. Um, that's an interesting story. Uh, it's that sort of universal theme of a struggle against nature. Will, how will we survive? So part of the process of uh, doing an interview is who do you want to talk to? 
I'm trying to land on this. Uh, sorry, there we go. Who do you want to talk to or whom do you want to talk to and why? And this is the part that oftentimes uh, reporters don't think through. Who do you want to talk to and why? And I, I think of it in the, in the three E's. Um, you need experts and explainers and eyewitnesses. Uh, you need the experts for the official version. So again, if you're talking about refugees or if you're talking about international conflict, you need the official version. Those are the po folks who can provide the official account. And many of them are used to dealing with journalists. Um, a lot of them aren't, but many of them are. Then you need the explainers who are gonna give you some context um, and who uh, can maybe give you some history and some background. But this is, this is the part that, I again, I think a lot of journalists just stop with the experts and the explainers. Um, in my opinion, they're gonna be the least interesting people in your stories. Uh, they're the most careful, they're the most guarded. And for some reason, uh, journalists, again, especially young journalists, think whatever story they're working on, they have to talk to the president of something the CEO or, um, or whatever. And the reality is presidents and leaders rarely know anything about the day-to-day -day stuff. And so you might need them for an expert uh, um, perspective, but they aren't gonna be your best sources. Uh, the eyewitnesses or what I call the stakeholders, those are the ones who can provide the details. They can provide the five senses, uh, the impact and the consequence, the human complexity. That's what I think we're looking for in a lot of the stories that we're writing is that human complexity. They're gonna be your most important sources. There's a new highway going in through your town uh, or a new high rise, who will be affected by this? That's who you talk to. Uh, at my school, we opened a food pantry during the pandemic for people who just didn't have enough uh, didn't have enough food, and the student newspaper did a story about it. And it, you know, of course they should. It's a it's an interesting story. It's a new service. Uh, they talked to the student government people who voted it through, and there was a lot of self congratulating. But I read the story and I said, what about the students who came to pick up the food? Uh, we don't have to make them. Um, uh, feel uh, badly about it, but those are the stakeholders in, uh, in that story. They're the ones who will be uh, affected the most. So that's why I think uh, we've got to think through the stakeholder uh, portion. Now, there are some people who are going to be reluctant to speak to you. Uh, and uh, sometimes they have, in my opinion, very le legitimate reasons. Maybe they don't have time. Um, and I'll say this about people who don't have time, very few people factor you into their day. You're always gonna be an intrusion. You're always going to be an interruption. And so they have some pretty good reasons for why they're reluctant to, uh, uh, to speak to you. Um, unless the person is a PR person and, uh, and uh, but we, we just don't, I don't know, maybe you're different, maybe, but we don't like to inconvenience people. However, that's our job. And, uh, or there's another reason why people are reluctant is that they had a bad experience uh, with a reporter. And you come along and you represent all the bad stuff that happened uh, in their past, or they've been convinced that all you're trying to do is tear things down and, and disrupt things and you're an enemy of the people. But there are some, uh, there are some additional ways uh, to those uh, that we can address who would rather not talk to us. Um, I think things, it, lines like this story needs your unique perspective. That's on the one hand, you're flattering them and appealing to their ego, but it's also probably true. Uh, so it's, it's not all manipulation here. Um, uh, but you can, uh, you can then address, uh, yeah, but you haven't talked to me. I've done this hundreds of times where somebody's reluctant to talk to, to me because I'm a reporter, they had a bad experience. I say, yeah, but have you ever had a bad experience with me? Have I ever treated you badly? Have I ever gotten something wrong? And then now we're making some sort of a personal uh, uh, connection. I'm not a member of a group, I'm just this guy. Um, 
And probably the most useful line in getting somebody who's reluctant to talk to you is this third one that says, I need your help. People, I think, are, are generally uh, wired to, uh, to help you out. If you're a young journalist in particular, or a, a student journalist specifically, play that card. I'm just getting started. I'm just a student. Come on, help me out here. You'll be <laughs> amazed at the number of people who will let you in uh, and give you some time if you, um, if you use that, come on, I'm just getting started. Everybody remembers when they were getting started. Um, or addressing this, uh, nobody else has your expertise. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna be better informed if if we have this. I've actually used a, an additional line addressing this that said, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this story, and it's not gonna be as good if you're not gonna be in it. But I'm still gonna do the story. The story would be a lot better if it had your perspective in there. And so uh, that awesome uh, often is. Uh, is useful. And then I think this last one is super important where you just say to them, your story matters. Um, this, in my opinion, is a huge part of interviewing. Uh, we're saying that we want your voice in this. This is a little counterintuitive to uh, students uh, uh, because uh, basically what we're saying is, I wanna, I wanna honor your story. I wanna honor your perspective. Um, I'll give you one other example from uh, from working with the Boston Globe. They sent me to a neighborhood after there had been a serial killer who had gone through a number of neighborhoods. Um, and it was just an awful uh, uh, time. Uh, and that killer was still on the loose. And the Globe sent me up to the neighborhood, the most recent neighborhood where this killer had attacked. And I just thought, nobody's going to talk to me. What, there, were, Everybody's afraid. And I would be afraid. So this stranger comes knocking on your door. I, I had very low uh, hopes that this would, uh, this would work. Um, and so I just, uh, I, I knocked on some doors and pretty soon somebody opened a door and uh, I said, I'm a reporter. I'd love to talk to you about what happened here last week. And she just pointed her finger across the street. She said, go across the street. That's where the, the person who survived, that's where she ran after she had been attacked. I go there. I knock on that door. This person who answered the door, I was stunned. She so badly wanted to tell her story that uh, I had asked for maybe 15 minutes of just talking out there in the doorway. She invited me into her house. Remember, there's a killer on the loose. I, I, didn't, I didn't match his profile, but there's still a killer out there. And um, she invites me in, she made me lunch. She, uh, she wanted to tell me everything. And, uh, and here's what I keep going back to. Again, it's counterintuitive. People want to tell their story. They really do. Um, so this is uh, um, one of the things that, uh, that I think, again, young people, but even, even veterans, you just have to keep coming back to. Really, your best selling point on talking to people is your authenticity. Um, I think the more authentic you are, that's that's kind of your soul being out there for uh, for people to uh, to people to witness. Uh, your uh, and I hate to put it in marketing terms, but your authenticity is your brand. Um, this is your true self. Um, you don't have to imitate anybody. I had a, a, a student journalist say to me one time, "Do you think I'd be more uh, successful if I incorporated more humor?" into my interviews the way you do? And I said, no, 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 don't imitate me. Develop kind of your own, um, your own method. And uh, the more authentic you are, I think the more people are, uh, are gonna trust you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, one example. I, I had a kid, uh, I was sitting in my, in my home office and I'm, I was working on a book project there's a knock on the door. There was nobody else home. My kids were gone. My wife was gone. And for whatever reason, I got up to answer the door. I'm, I'm writing. I'm not interested in answering the door. But for whatever reason, that day, I answered the door. And I opened the door. And here's this kid. My guess is he was about 11 or 12. 
dressed in really kind of awkward clothing. He looked physically just kind of awkward standing there. And, um, and here's what he said. He, he kind of adjusts his glasses and he says, uh, I'm going to try to sell you something. That was his opening line. And I thought, you know what? I don't care what you're selling. I'm buying it. So I just reached for my wallet. As soon as he said that, I reached for my wallet. He was selling some candy. I don't need any candy. I gave it away. Um, but my point is, he started out totally authentic. And I thought, whatever, whatever this interaction is going to be after I see that authenticity, I'm in. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. So um, I think that kind of authenticity is very compelling. That's what makes people trust you. So um, the other thing that is going to make people trust you is how uh, is in how prepared you are. And so let me uh, um, let me go to uh, this one. Unless it's for a breaking news story, where you're just trying to find out from an eyewitness what happened, the best interviews will be when you already know the answers to most of the questions. And so now what you're doing is you aren't looking for facts, you're looking for perspective, you're looking for an insight or an anecdote or something. Um, you could tell in that quote, in that clip from the movie, Almost Famous, the reason they trusted that boy was that he was prepared. He knew that band, he knew their names, he knew the answers to their to, to what they were doing as a, as a band. That's what makes people uh, trust you. You're just trying to get their unique uh, point of view. Preparation puts everybody at ease. They just know that uh, they're going to be in good hands if they sense they don't have to educate you. Um, the other thing it does, especially with officials, it, it uh, limits, maybe even eliminates uh, lying and, uh, and spin. I had a, uh, a writer come to our writer's symposium years ago where I found out his original book was something he was kind of embarrassed about. And uh, he didn't want it in print. He didn't give the rights to digital prints. Uh, he wanted it taken off of shelves. It, it was written back in the 19, late 1960s. And when I saw that he was really concerned about that book, not for any reason that was mean-spirited, but I, I, at our university, I found a, a librarian who tracked down a copy of that book. And... Um, and got it through an interlibrary loan. So I had a copy of that book with me when I interviewed him. Now, what that is communicating in a nonverbal way is, I know a lot about you. I've prepared for this. Uh, so don't even think about, uh, um, about not telling me the truth. Uh, I, I just, it just, they see that you've done your homework and, um, and it, it just makes them trust you. Um, I think, in interviews, uh, you should plan your questions. Uh, I'm going to get to this one in just a second, uh, but I'm trying to trying to get to this particular slide. That um, yeah, so I think you want to plan your questions. Sorry, I'm just having a hard time uh, landing on the proper uh, slide here. We'll go one up. I, when, when I say plan your questions, that means a lot of different things. Some writers, uh, reporters write their questions down. I often do that. What I do more often, though, is just write down the topics I want to address. Um, some reporters know only their first question, and then they trust their instinct for the follow-up. I, I spoke at a university in uh, Barranquilla, uh, Colombia, in South America a couple of years ago, and it was a press freedom uh, uh, conference. And I was one of the speakers there. And a uh, magazine writer from uh, Bogota was going to interview me in front, of the, uh, in front of the audience. And so I just said to him backstage, I said, so do you have questions ahead of time? You know, um, do you know where we're going? And, and I've, I've never seen anybody do this live like this. He said, no, I only have one question. The rest of what we talk about is going to be up to your answer. And I thought, well, now that's bold. That is bold. And what he wanted to talk about was press freedom in the uh, in the Donald Trump administration. And then, based on what I answered, 
that's what dictated where else that interview went. I thought that was that was a gutsy uh, move on his uh, on his part to not have it all kind of uh, prepared, but he he trusted his own uh, instinct. So when um, when I do uh, interviews, let me just uh, get to the next one here. Um, uh, I usually start with relatively easy questions. You don't want to waste a lot of time, but you want to just kind of put the, uh, the person at ease. Um, and then if you've got a difficult question to ask somebody that where you're going to really hold that person accountable, you don't want to start there. Uh, you want to wait until, in my opinion, you want to wait until about two thirds of the way into the interview. That way you've still got something useful if the person uh, just wants to end that interview at that moment because they don't like the, uh, uh, they don't like the, the question. Um, and then uh, any, a couple of easy questions at the end. So I think of, of interviews the way I think of a story, that there's, an, there's a beginning and then there's a middle that builds up to perhaps a climactic point or an important point um, of intensity. Then you've got some kind of a cool down. Um, and then you've always gotta be ready to uh, improvise uh, as that boy was able to do in the, uh, the almost famous clip uh, that I showed you before. Um, I got uh, the great basketball player, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to come to our writer's symposium. Um, and the way I got him to come was I appealed to his self-interest. Um, I, I made it, I said to my opening line in my invitation was, I don't want to talk to you about basketball. He's the most, one of the most famous basketball players in the history <clears throat> of the NBA. And uh, I said, I want to talk to you about basketball. I want to talk to you about writing because he's a really good writer. Um, and uh, I noticed many of the things that uh, I had written, uh, I had read many of the things he had written and quoted from them. Uh, and so in this clip that I'm going to show you now with my interview, uh, from my interview with him, I asked him when he realized uh, that he could write. Now, keep something in mind when you watch this. I already knew the answer. I already knew the answer to this question, but I wanted the human voice. I wanted the human anecdote. Uh, and, and you can see that, uh, it was revealed that I was prepared. I think really the, um, the place where I figured that I actually could write had more to do with going to UCLA. Um, I had a teacher, his name was, uh, Lindstrom. In fact, he lives down here in San Diego now, but, uh, Mr. Lindstrom, uh, based our grades on, uh, our, our final essay of the, of the, uh, of the quarter. And he said he was going to read the three best essays and then give us our, our grades. And I was like waiting and waiting. I was like, when, when's he going to be finished? And then he read my essay. As he read your essay in class? In class as the best one. And I was like, wow. That had to feel pretty cool. Yeah, it made me feel very cool. I was like, maybe I could write, you know. Hmm. But of course, uh, you know, I had, um, had an NBA career to, to deal with between... <laughs> that point and and finally getting the opportunity to write but what was it about um the essay was about me <clears throat> meeting a friend of mine and going to a jazz club it was the village vanguard wasn't it yeah how'd you know dude i do my research oh you must have yeah <laughs> so yeah i i read it and people it was funny a after the class let out people were well, well, what happened who'd you see that night and stuff so, you know, I, it struck me that maybe I, I could write, but um, I had a, had a few things to do with, uh, with hoops between then and when I actually did start to write after my NBA career was over. Do you ever think about what your life would have been like if you had gone into journalism instead? You could have, you could have actually been somebody. <laughs> maybe you, we'll, we'll never know, you know? No, no. I'm <laughs> So, so there's an example where it, you could just see he got a little more comfortable once, once I showed him that I knew what I was talking about. I already knew the answer to that question of what, what was his essay about. And then he was a little more forthcoming. He, he just felt like he could trust me a little more, I think. Now, if there's a difficult uh, question uh, that's, that's in your uh, interview that you think you need to ask, um, again, young reporters, uh, oftentimes just don't want to upset somebody. But here's, there are some reasons why 
uh, it's okay to go ahead and ask the, uh, the difficult question. Uh, one is your audience expects it. Um, uh, your editor, I promise you, your editor expects it. Uh, and here's the other thing, um, your source expects you to ask it. So you think you're avoiding it by avoiding conflict, your source is actually expecting uh, that question from you. But I again, just like we began, you wanna make it a conversation, not, a, not an interrogation. And keep in mind, uh, you're not trying to win an argument. Uh, this isn't an argument. You're trying to get a perspective. You're trying to get an explanation. Um, when I brought the writer uh, Alice Walker to our writer's symposium, there were some sponsors who didn't want to participate as sponsors uh, for her appearance because they felt that she had taken some controversial stands, particularly on, um, on matters of uh, Palestinians, treating Palestinians as people. And uh, some of our sponsors wanted us to cancel. Uh, they were going to uh, really uh, resist this. And I said, let me ask her. In the interview, I'm gonna ask her about it. And so um, that gave her a chance to explain. And, and I'll show you the clip uh, because this, this is the issue that people felt was so uh, uh, difficult about Alice Walker that they didn't want to, they didn't want to even have her in, uh, in town. And so I just said, no, I'll, I'll ask her. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you what the aftermath was uh, after, I, uh, um, after I show this to you. Sorry, there we go. So here's, here's another reason why people have intense emotions about you. You've been a supporter, vocal supporter of Fidel Castro in Cuba, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, First Americans, you've appeared with them on different protests uh, in North America, and more recently, Palestinians. Mm -hmm. That's not recent, that's old. Well, okay, but, but, and you've got this conspiracy guy on your, on your David website. David Icke. Yeah, yeah, David Icke. Um, are you just trying to find ways to upset people? <laughs> be, be, because you've got a lot of people saying because of David Icke and because of your pro-Palestinian or your pro-Palestinians are people position, you get accused of being anti-Semitic and hating Jews and all that. What, what's that about? Well, the foundation, funnily enough, is in my marriage. Uh, I married this wonderful Jewish man, a lawyer, and after the Six-Day War, when Israel took all the land that they had, you know, conquered uh, and refused to give it back, we had an argument because I thought that the land should be returned to the people. And he thought it did not, and he thought that because I thought it should have been, that that meant I was anti-Semitic and not in favor of Israel. But I tell you, uh, there is in this slur that, that is graining ground, unfortunately, in our country, something that is really very dangerous. It will soon be so that whatever you say against the behavior of the Israeli government will be termed anti-Semitic. And this would be very dangerous, you know, and we must not let it happen. You have a right to your, your feelings, your expressions about anything. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the, the, the foundation of that. But as with anything else, I accept that I will be um, blamed or, or accused of whatever but I prefer to have done what I thought to be right, no matter what the consequence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the concern is just the presence of David Icke on your, on your website. Yeah. I love David Icke. Take it or leave it. No, that, that's fine, that's fine. So let me address that last question. That was the issue. It wasn't just the Palestinian thing, but she's got this conspiracy theory guy on her website and people just think he's a nutcase. And so by virtue of him being on her website, that she's a nutcase. And so I thought, well, there's no way to better way to find out than to just ask her. 
you can ask a question without it being an interrogation, without it being an accusation. And again, this was about two thirds of the way through the interview. So if that had upset her, we still had something useful uh, prior to that. Uh, when this interview was over, I, she and I were walking to the car and I just said, I really appreciate your speaking uh, about, uh, about the Palestinian issue, about this David Icke conspiracy theory guy. I said, I'm sure you get sick of answering that question. This, this is the important point here. She said, most people are too afraid to ask me about it, so they never hear my perspective. She said, I'm glad you asked it. So from that vantage point, keep in mind, even she was relieved uh, that we got into uh, that topic, all right? So here are some things to keep in mind uh, when we talk about uh, uh, doing your interviews. I think where you do your interview matters. Location matters. Choose carefully. Uh, in my opinion, restaurants are terrible places to conduct an interview. They're just way too noisy. Uh, if you're gonna record it, all you're gonna get is the espresso machine or clinking uh, silverware or whatever. Um, so restaurants are, are very difficult places to conduct an interview. Um, people's homes. Homes are okay, uh, but there are certain places in a person's home that in my opinion are not okay. If they're in a home where there's a living room, for instance, don't do your interview there. Don't do your interview in somebody's living room. Nothing interesting happens in a person's living room. I'll tell you where all of the action always is, and that's where you should conduct your interview. Do it in the kitchen. The kitchen is where you do the interview. That's where all the life is in that home. So conduct it there if, uh, if at all possible. Uh, I, I did a book on the, uh, the Anglican priest who was also a physicist, a guy named John Polkinghorne. He just died last year. I did an entire book on him um, and went to Cambridge where he was the head of the physics program there and went to several different uh, places to conduct the interview. I interviewed him in the chapel where he felt like this was what God was wanting him to do, uh, was to go uh, become an Anglican priest. Uh, I went to his home where he raised his kids. I, so I, my point is, I went to very men, I went to several places that were significant in his background. And, um, and that just drew stuff out of him, that drew memories, that drew experiences that just sitting around his house would not have, uh, uh, would not have drawn out. Uh, the next part is listen. I know that it just sounds obvious, but Again, interviewers oftentimes uh, just are thinking about their next question as opposed to uh, really zeroing in on what is being said. Um, and interviewers sometimes are really afraid of silence. And I'm telling you, silence is crucial. Uh, it's actually, I consider it part of the grammar uh, of an interview. Uh, go ahead and be quiet for a really long time. I just did an interview with uh, Cornell West. It's not up yet, but uh, I did an interview with him just last month. And um, I asked, because his mom has, had just recently died and I was asking her him about his mom. And so he answered, and then I could just tell something about his body language uh, that there was more to say, but he was a little emotional. So I just let it sit there. Remember this, these are televised, uh, but even that silence, was effective because it allowed him to really think about, okay, what else do I wanna say about my mom, my, my, my recently uh, departed mom? Um, I think how you present yourself in an interview, I think that matters. Uh, if you wanna be taken seriously, I think you need to look like you're a pro. Um, <clears throat> when you do the interview, I, I mean, use your whole body. This is, this is a performance art that we're doing here. You gotta lean in, you gotta raise your eyebrows, you gotta nod, you gotta, Hold up your hands if you don't understand something. Um, uh, it's, uh, that's part of the, uh, the act of listening. Um, uh, here's, here's a really important dimension to all interviews. Somebody is going to control that interview. And my point to you is, it has to be you. It has to be you. If it's a PR person, if it's a government official, 
They're going to try to own it. They're going to try to control it. You have to keep reeling it in. Um, you can do that in a in a uh, a firm but not obnoxious way. Uh, you also need to keep it uh, conversational. Even but if they say something that's that's just incorrect or obnoxious, then um, I think you can disrupt that in a gentle human way and say, no, no hold on, that's not my understanding. Um, when you're taking notes, and I say when, even though you're recording it, you should also be taking notes. I promise you at some point in your career, your recording device will stop functioning. And when that happens, and if you haven't taken notes, you're in trouble. Your short-term memory is not that good. So you've got, when you're taking notes, go ahead and take the time. They're, uh, they're speaking, go ahead and take the time. Let some silence linger while you're finishing, uh, finishing up your notes. You know why? Your source wants you to get it right. Not just you, your source wants it right. Uh, as I mentioned, if you record it, you also need to take notes. And then afterwards, type up those notes. Again, I said uh, your, your short-term memory is pretty good, um, but uh, you, gotta, you gotta type those notes up and get them into complete sentences. None of us uh, write in complete sentences. Uh, and so uh, that's a, a, a chance for you to fill in the uh, uh, fill in the gaps. Now, the, the point about controlling uh, an interview, uh, uh, let me just give you a quick clip uh, from uh, Alice Walker's, uh, my interview with Alice Walker and, and see how she tries to take control of the interview and then watch how I won't let her. Your biographer, Evelyn White, said in the preface of her book that the th reason she was drawn to you was by this question. What was it about Alice Walker and her work that always seemed to generate such intense emotion? What do you think that is? What is it about you and your work that just generates all this stuff? What do you think? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not my therapist. No. <laughs> Although I like you better than my therapist. Oh, good. That's good. So just for that moment, she says, what do you think? Uh, that's not, she's not interviewing me. I'm interviewing her. This is my point. Somebody has to control that interview, and it always has to be you. There's a couple of good examples of this. Megan Kelly does a, a really good interview with Alex Jones, where he tries to uh, own the interview, and she just keeps pulling, pulling it back. Jonathan Swan of Axios does one with uh, President Trump uh, during the coronavirus, um, and and he just uh, he just kept bringing it back to no wait a second I'm the one asking the questions here, um, so then there are some questions to ask at the end of every interview. Uh, I think you ought to uh, sorry. And every interview, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get to this, this way. Would you spell your name for me? I think uh, if if I heard Jennifer Arul say, uh, yeah, my name's Jennifer Arul. I don't know. I'd spell Arul maybe A R O O L. Um, I so I would say, spell your name for me, or give me a bit. Could you give me a business card or something like that? People. Everybody who's ever had a story written about them, where they've gotten their name misspelled, it just makes them mad. And it's it, here's the thing. It's the most gettable fact in your entire story. And so when students misspell a name in one of their stories for uh, my journalism classes, I just stop reading the story. I just give them a zero. And uh, they have to do a different story for this reason. If you can't even get the person's name spelled right, why should I believe anything else that's in your story? That's the easiest fact you can possibly get in the story. And you're gonna make a friend, especially if the person has um, a spelling that's a little difficult. I always ask, uh, is there anything I should have asked at the end, uh, uh, but didn't? Uh, that just opens up all sorts of great stuff. Um, here's maybe one of the more important ones, and that is who else should I talk to about this? And what that does is the person you're talking to says, well, you know, the person who actually knows a lot more about this than me is, and then they tell you who that person is, that person is going to be gold. 
And then you always want to know if you can uh, uh, contact them uh, if you have questions. This opens the uh, the door for uh, further discussion. So, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of things that uh, you got to get clear with your sources, and you have to do this every single time. Um, what do these terms mean? I want to interview you on background. I will interview you, but I won't attribute this information to you. What do we mean by the term off the record? Uh, I have a former student who just was interviewing a, a, a city a government official who had just been elected. She's in her early 30s. The, the official is in her early 30s. She's never been in public office before. My former student uh, goes up to her and says, okay, I'd you know, like to ask a couple of questions. And she says, okay, this is, but this is all gonna be off the record. She says that. And he said to her, no, it's not. You're a public official. Everything you and I are going to talk about is going to be on the record. And she said, oh, OK. So my, my point is, people throw these terms around, and you're the one who has to know what they mean. Off the record means you can't use it. Uh, not for attribution means you can use the information. You just can't tie it to that person in an identifiable way. Background means you're just going to get you just want this person to educate you on this topic of uh, cryptocurrency or of you know whatever. You just want to, you want to be educated about it. But the thing is, you and your sources have to agree what these terms mean, and you got to do it before the interview. I interviewed a uh, congressman a long time ago. We had a very long conversation. The interview was about the border between the United States and Mexico here in San Diego and Tijuana. And when that conversation was over. He said, no, you know, this was all off the record. He said this after the interview. And I said, no, sir, it wasn't. Uh, you knew I was a reporter. Uh, you knew you were talking to a reporter. Um, this is all on the record. And he said, OK, well, this is the last interview I'll ever do with you. Well, I didn't, I didn't care. I wasn't trying to date him. Um, I, just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to get some information from him. So uh, that, was, that was OK. But the point is. Government officials, they typically know better, uh, but you got to have those terms clarified before the interview. Um, so let me just uh, give you a couple of uh, movies that if you want to see portrayals of uh, interviews, I'm, I've just listed a, a, a few titles here. The, the one I showed you at the beginning, Almost Famous, it, you, People think it's a movie about rock and roll music, but it's really, in my opinion, it's a clinic on uh, interview. There's a movie that uh, very few people have heard of uh, called The Company You Keep. So some wonderful interview scenes. Uh, there's a movie called Frost Nixon, where you see the evolution of the, the, uh, the reporter, David Frost, as he's interviewing uh, Richard Nixon. He, he starts out as this very, very scared, uh, timid guy. And by the end of the movie, you can see him really get his, uh, uh, get his courage. Um, a couple of other uh, uh, movie titles that you might want to look at. Uh, there's a movie called Spotlight uh, that I think is one of the best movies about journalism you'll ever see. And there's some magnificent interviewing scenes in there. There's another one about the, the writer David Foster Wallace called The End of the Tour. Uh, a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood is, a, is a, a story about Mr. Rogers, the television, children's television guy, and the relationship he develops with a, uh, uh, a writer from uh, Esquire magazine. And uh, marvelous interviewing scenes in there. And if you can find, I'm having a hard time finding it. Um, I watched it several times. In fact, I did a story about it. The, the interview Oprah did with uh, Megan and Harry is actually really good. Uh, she really did a good job, uh, in my opinion, um, with that. So I think you look at those and you just pay attention to interviews that uh, go well. Uh, when you listen to them, you wonder, okay, why did that go so well? So go ahead and deconstruct it. I do this in my book, by the way. Um, I get some, I've got some transcripts uh, of some interviews, and I, I break them down for you as to why they work and why they don't work. But then listen to podcasts, listen to interviewers. There's a reason why Ira Glass and Terry Gross and Mark Marin and Krista Tippett 
and some of these others, why they're so successful. Uh, it isn't just great editing. It's they've got good methods. And my point is, take those methods, steal them, make them, uh, make them your own, and then avoid some of your others. Like with Mark Maron, the comedian, uh, he's got a podcast called WTF. He just talks way too much about himself, in my opinion. Uh, this is about somebody else. And so you see that and say, oh, yeah, I can see the temptation uh, to do that. I don't want to do that. Um, so, yeah, get those transcripts. So I think there are just a couple of things I want to uh, try to get at. Um, think about your questions. Instead of cliche questions uh, like, how did it feel? I mean, I, I'm always yelling at my television during the Olympics or during a sporting event. Somebody has spent four years, maybe 20 years, preparing for this moment. They win or they crash. And the best question you can think of is, how does it feel? I, you just got to do better than that. You got to do better than that. Um, um, how did this turn out differently? Have you ever experienced something like this before? If you prepared for this interview, you know that there are going to be some parallel moments in that person's past. Um, and then uh, connect, it, uh, connect it locally. Um, I, I'll give you uh, an example. I know we gotta, we're running out of time here. <clears throat> um, my dad uh, was in his 90s when he was approached by the Smithsonian Institution in Washington uh, to ask for his account during World War II. They were doing a project called Witness to War. And my dad was uh, stationed his entire time in the army he was stationed on the Arctic Circle, uh, and, and he and five guys in a weather station on the Arctic Circle for two years. Think about that. Five guys on an Arctic exploration station doing weather reports every hour, 24 hours a day, so that the Allies would know what was going to be the weather over the continent, and it would help them arrange bombing runs and things like that. So the Witness to War project comes over to my dad's apartment. I was there. I was just standing in the background. I thought, oh, this is going to be awesome because he's going to have a perspective. And the first question the guy asks him, now keep, keep in mind what I just told you. The first question the guy asks him is, what was it like to be in the Arctic for a couple of years during World War II? I immediately started my, pulling my hair out. What was it like? That's the best question you can ask. What was it like? Dude, it wasn't like anything. There's nothing like that. You, you can't ask a 93-year-old guy to tell you what was this like. So my dad takes off his glasses. He polishes them. He clears a bunch of phlegm. He's trying to decide, what do, I don't know how to answer a question that's that general. How about a better question might have been, what'd y'all do for food up there? Did you get any mail from anybody? Did anybody go crazy? I mean, think about it. But what was it like? That's the best you got? Oh, my gosh. I was so, uh, what did you do for fun? You know, as it turned out, yeah, somebody did go crazy. They put him on a dog sled and sent him down to some bay where he got picked up. Anyway. Questions that begin with how and why are always going to get you better answers than who, what, when, uh, or, or, or where. Always. Those open-ended questions are always going to be better. If you're interviewing celebrities, uh, we don't have to talk about celebrities um, uh, unless you want to, uh, but you can ask them, connect it to local issues. So here's the shameless self-promotion piece of this, and then I'm done. Um, if you want to look at some of these interviews that I've done with great writers, you can go to my website. There's a tab on there that says interviews with writers. I have dozens of conversations with famous writers. You can look at my, uh, my book. There it is. There's the self-promotion right there. Product placement is what that's called. And, um, and here's how you can reach me if, uh, if, if you want. And I am done. <laughs>